person. They lost. Sort of. I think I shall be over there somewhere. You're not up here on your own, are you? I'm with the school. We're doing this kind of quiz thing. I kind of wandered off and lost the others. I'm in big trouble when I get back. Let me guess. You came in a minibus and it's parked in a lay-by, right? Yeah, but... Fantastic view from here, isn't it? You can see everything. Don't worry. I'll get you back. Who are you? I'm the keeper. The keeper? What's a keeper? What do you keep? You see all this land out here? This is my patch. 2,000 acres, as far as the eye can see. And it's my job to look after it and manage it. Yeah, but what does a keeper do? What's your name, son? Adam. Right, Adam. I'm Fred. Now, take a look around you. What do you see? Um, empty land. Sheep. Empty. That couldn't be farther from the truth. This is very much a managed landscape. Now, you see this patchwork effect across the moorland? That tells you that it's a managed piece of land. And managed by man, created by man. People like me, moorland gamekeepers, have been looking after moors like this for a couple of hundred years, particularly for the red grouse. But, of course, lots of other species of birds and animals benefit also. The red grouse, you could say, is my best friend, but I'm certainly his best friend. What's a grouse? What's a grouse? Come on, I'll show you. Red grouse are fantastic birds, you know, Adam. The special thing about them is you don't find them anywhere else in the world. And we can't rear them like you can with partridges and pheasants. Totally wild. And they make fantastic parents also. You know, I've even seen them trying to fight off a hawk ten times their size to protect the young and the eggs. And they mate and stay together till one of them or both of them are dead. Look. There's some grouse droppings there. You can see an adult bird roosted here last night. And look, not far off it, some chick droppings. Look at how smaller they are than the adult ones. How many chicks do they have? Well, it starts with the hen laying somewhere between six and ten eggs. She'll then incubate them for between 21 and 24 days. And the great thing about them is, they all hatch immediately together. They don't hatch over a period of days. It all happens at once. Within an hour, the whole brood of grouse can be out of the nest, running about, catching insects. Chicks live on insects for the first three to four weeks of their life. After that, they're on exactly the same diet as the adult birds, which is heather. They've got to mature quickly, cos it's a very harsh climate up here. Come on, let's go. What's all this black stuff? What do you think of this? Charcoal? No, it's heather. Where I burnt it. Not just any old way, mind, you know. That's when the hill farmer comes out and helps us, cos it's as beneficial to him as it is to me. If we can create this patchwork effect right across the moorland, it spreads the sheep out, and we create territories for the grouse. What's a territory? Well, a territory is a piece of ground that a pair of grouse will take up the spring station at. The cock grouse, which is the male, will protect this as much as he can, and he'll fight other cock grouse. It's very important that a pair of grouse have a territory, and it'll consist of long heather, 
and short heather. Long heather, of course, where it can get in out the way of hawks and falcons, and young heather, where they can graze, like this, look. There's some young heather there that we've burned. You see the mulch, or the mattress as we call it, this is where all the heather seed is. Heather seed will drop in over a period of years. And in fact, heather seed can actually lie dormant for something like a hundred years. But when I've bent it, just across the top mine, not into the peat where it'll do damage, now a summer fire would be totally different. There's probably a metre of peat underneath where we are here. And a summer fire would actually go straight down, not across. And peat burns like coal. And that would devastate the whole mole and that. It never comes back. You can see the black on the top and the brown on the bottom of the stick. The fire's gone over the top, but what it's did was it's cracked the seed, germinated it, let in the light, and immediately we've got a growth of lovely, young, nutritious heather, which the grouse absolutely thrive on. So there's a lot of thought goes into burning. It's not just done haphazardly. The keeper will have in his mind exactly where he wants to burn and under what wind. And it's always the autumn, the winter, or the very, very early spring. See, Adam, this burn's about six year old. So there's half a dozen different types of plants on it. The light stuff is the bilberry, then you've got the heather, and look, some bell heather, that's already flowered. Crowberry, which has the big black berries on it. Also, I've got several different types of mosses, including sphagnum moss. What sphagnum moss? Sphagnum moss is what makes peat. The whole moorland structure's built up on that, and it takes thousands of years for it to build up. What did you say that stuff was? Sphagnum moss. It's only a dog, Fred. Yeah, I know, I love dogs. I have nine at home, but I never bring them up on the moor at this time of the year. Why not? Can you imagine what would happen if a dog was running free and it ran into a brood of grouse or a brood of waders on a windy night? They would get scattered over a big area two or three hundred yards away. The mother's got to spend the next three or four hours calling to them to try to get them back together. And that's when they're very susceptible to predation. Or it might even come a thunderstorm and they'll be washed out. And also a sheep. If a dog chased a sheep for a two or three hundred yards, that sheep's probably pregnant and it could easily miscarriage its lambs. Between March and July, the breeding season, dogs should be on a short lead at all times on open moorland. Do you know what a merlin is, Fred? Do you? Like a magician? <laughs> no, come with me. I'll show you something really special and just how vulnerable ground nesting birds can be. Fred, what's that man doing? Hello, Fred. All nice right. to see you. Yeah, this is a young friend of mine, Adam. Hello, Adam. Oh, it's quite lucky, cos I'm just about to ring these merlins. Right, what I'm about to do is put one of these metal rings onto the leg of the bird. And I'm doing this as part of the British Trust for Ornithology's bird ringing scheme. And people have been ringing birds for, oh, nearly 100 years now to try and find out more information about birds. Each ring has got a, a number on it and an address. So if, in future, the bird is found, you can write to the address and find out more information about the history of the bird. Why do they live here? Right, well, that's a good question, and a lot of it's down to Fred and, and the way he manages the piece of moorland here. The merlins and the red grouse and the curlews that live up here, the golden plover, they're all ground-nesting birds, and they're all very susceptible to mammal predators such as uh, foxes and weasels and stoats. And Fred controls the numbers of those up here. You know, Fred's a protector of these merlins and the other upland birds that we get uh, around here. Right, we better be on our way, Mark. Nice to see you again, Mark. Thanks and you, for Fred, it's been a and pleasure. We'll see you again next year. I hope so. So you don't just look after grouse, then, Fred? Oh, absolutely not. 
90% of the birds that actually turn up in the spring and the summer are just visitors. They're just coming here really to rear their own young. We have a very high percentage of the nest and golden plover which come to this country. Now if this moorland didn't exist, then golden plover wouldn't have anywhere to go. That's why the triple SIs, which means the sites of special scientific interest. Also, of course, it's very important for its insect life and invertebrates, particularly the very beautiful emperor moth. Morning, Neil. How are you? I'm all right, how are you? Not bad. Have you got an assistant? Ah, uh, this is Adam. What about giving me Ann to put this wall on? Yes, please. Thank you. This is Neil, Adam. This is our sheep farmer. He looks after the sheep on here and grazes all the land and also maintains all these walls that you see. I want to keep the sheep on the moor most of the year. And just at certain times, that's when they're lambing or when they're mating, I want to keep them in the fields. So that's why we have to build these walls up. Find some good flat stones. Try that one. Have you seen much, Neil? I've not seen many crows. No. Oh, that's it. Good. I saw a nice brood of grouse when I first came here. Oh, lovely. Well grown? Aye, they were. They fluttered off, yeah. Good. Yeah, they're good grouse. Excellent, ground. yes. Yeah. How's this regeneration plot doing, Fred? It's doing very well, Neil. Very, very well. It's grown. And uh, hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll be able to turn sheep back into it. Good. Anyhow, come on, we'll have to be going. Adam, can I have my gloves back? You're not going to help me to finish it. <laughs> see you, Neil. All right, Adam, see you. Thanks. Fred, why do you carry a gun? Well, if I was a road sweeper, I'd carry a brush, wouldn't I? Yeah, but why do you have a gun? Listen, Curlew, there he is, look, over there. That's just one of a few species of wading birds who come here to nest every spring and summer. There's Curlew, Golden Plover, Peewits, Dunlin, Snipe. And you know what? They all come under the umbrella of my protection, as well as the red grouse. Now, all these wading birds attract a lot of predators but particularly foxes, stoats, weasels. They're all trying to get their food, so they're all predating all the wading birds. The curlew in particular is very important. He's a real keeper's friend. He'll actually follow your fox all the way across the moor, diving at them, twittering, and telling me that there's something about. That's why I carry this, for the odd opportunity that I get. And also we have the corvids which is the crow family. Carrying crows, magpies, rooks, jackdaws, they're all egg thieves, but in particular, the carrion crow. He's a real nasty. Now, a pair of carrion crows can account for somewhere up to 200 eggs. Now, that's an awful lot of wading chicks and grouse chicks, so we need to protect them. So it's important that we maintain this balance by controlling the predators. And the way we do it with the corvids, is a tool that we call a larson trap. Can I see a trap? Yeah, come on, there's one over here. Wow. This is a larson trap. You have to feed and water these, you know, and look after them well. It's much better if we've got a nice, healthy decoy that jumps about and attracts other crows. So we feed them and water them every day. What kind of food's that then, Fred? It's an all-in-one dog food, Adam. It's what we feed them on, and they thrive on it. Look how well looked after he is. What kind of bird's that one? It's a carrion crow. And just have a look at his beak. Look at how vicious that is. Now, not only can he kill little chicks and eat lots of eggs, but at this time of the year, and particularly early spring, and they're all having the lambs, and he'll target any weak lamb and he'll be straight there. Especially if a lamb has twins and they give birth to one and move away a little bit to give birth to another, the carrion crows will be waiting. They don't just target dead lambs, live ones, and they'll peck the eyes straight out of them. 
Some members of the general public tend to think they'd be doing a favour by letting this bird out. Where in actual fact, they'd be doing a great disservice to maybe a hundred or so wading birds or red grouse. How does a trap work? Come on, I'll show you. What happens is, the crow comes round, he sees this one, and he comes in to attack it, and he perches on there and lands there. The door closes and catches them. Do you like to reset it? Yes. Uh, don't worry, we're going to take all our litter home with us. Yeah, it's all well and good. It's not that I'm worried about, actually. It's the uh, cigarettes. Oh, but one little cigarette isn't going to set the grouse moor on fire, is it? That couldn't be farther from the truth, actually, because all fires actually start as small as that cigarette. It's only a couple of years ago that that whole hillside was devastated with fire. So, if you must smoke, if you don't mind, if I could just... Uh, Give you one of these each. All oh, right. They're a special butt pouch, and I'd very much appreciate it if you use them. All oh, right. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right. Have a good day. Thank Enjoy you. your walk. Thanks. Is that true, then? Oh yeah. In 2003, you know, there was 30,000 acres of heather moorland went up in smoke in the summer. Devastating fires. Loss of habitat and all them wonderful birds can't come back to nest here. Of course, that's why we don't allow campfires and barbecues and things like that on the moor. Too much of a precious environment to lose. So, Adam, what do you think the fastest flying game bird is? The grouse. That's right. How fast do you think? 20 miles an hour. Oh, try 80. You could imagine a cover of grouse coming over that hill there. 10 or 15 grouse, and the guy shooting them would be lucky if he got one or two. They're so fast. You shoot them after you've looked after them so carefully. Well, we only shoot the surplus. Probably less than one in 10 gets shot. And the keeper very much decides when shooting starts and when it stops. On a very good year, on 2,000 acres, you might only shoot eight days. Sometimes it might be only two or three days. And on a very bad breeding year, you might not shoot at all. If I say there isn't enough grouse to shoot, we don't shoot. Well, Adam, what do you reckon? I'm still thinking about it. I suppose it's like having a chicken for a Sunday lunch, except these birds are wild. Well, I'll tell you, these red grouse will have a much better life than any factory farm chicken. The mini boss. Excuse me, yeah. don't you think you should have that dog on the lead? Why? Didn't you see the sign? What sign? And don't say there aren't any sheep, because they're just over the hill. Yeah, if you say so. There could be ground nesting birds anywhere. Oh, God. Sorry. Here, Pim. Come here. Hello? Here. There's a little memento of your visit to keep. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 